The movie shows U.S. military defense forces lurking in a settlement in Pakistan known to be the hideout of a terrorist group called al Kohe. As a troop of U.S. military troops began arriving in the area, many children and women ran in to hide in their homes. They knew that U.S. military forces would attack their settlements. The operation, led by a Secretary of Defense, George Callister, aimed to bombard al Kohe's forces suspected of threatening the security of the United States of America. George then reported to a Defense Department commander, Thomas Morgan, that the entire U.S. military force had been in their position, and they only had to wait for orders from the President to initiate the attack. Commander George also said that they have used an artificial intelligence-based tracking system that can detect face matches of criminals or terrorists. But currently, the AI tracking system states that the terrorists' face match rate was only 37 to 51 percent, meaning they could have picked the wrong attack target. The AI system notified the operator to cancel the mission because the target did not match the terrorism perpetrator profile database they were looking for. Therefore, Thomas contacted the U.S. president to inform him that their assault mission should be canceled. But the president urged that U.S. military forces resume the operation because he knew al Kohe's troops had only been out of their headquarters once every two years. Commander George and Thomas were confused by the situation because they could have attacked innocent people. Thomas decided not to follow the orders of the U.S. president. Therefore, the special forces under the direct command of the U.S. president attacked the residential area using an unmanned fighter capable of bombarding the area. The scene turns to a small casino bar where a young man named Jerry is playing poker with his two friends at the bar. Realizing that he would win the game, Jerry tricked his friends into raising their betting to earn a lot more money. Both of his friends agreed to increase their bets. Jerry immediately showed his cards to them, and he won the game. After getting all the betting money, Jerry returned from the casino with a feeling of pleasure. He went back to his apartment by taking the subway and stopped at an ATM to check the amount of money he had left. His balance was very small because his salary was still unpaid. Even though Jerry won the betting money from the poker games at the casino, it was still not enough to pay off his apartment rent. He was forced to pay the rent by spending half the money he had just gotten from the casino. Shortly after, Jerry got a call from his mother informing him that Jerry's twin brother Ethan had died. After hearing the sad news, Jerry could only limp and cry sadly, knowing that his twin brother had left for good. The following day, Jerry went to church to attend Ethan's funeral ceremony, and paid his last respects to the twin brother he loved so much. After the funeral, Jerry's father approached and asked him to continue his studies. His father said that he would cover all the expenses Jerry needed to pay for college, but Jerry refused and said that he could live independently without relying on the help of his parents. Returning from Ethan's funeral, Jerry went back to the ATM center to check his balance. Unexpectedly, the amount in Jerry's account suddenly amounted to a lot. Jerry was confused by the incident because an unknown person suddenly sent a large amount of money to his account. Jerry panicked and immediately rushed to his apartment just to find that his apartment was already filled with weapons and other equipment. Shortly after, Jerry was contacted by a woman who referred to herself as Arya and told Jerry to immediately flee the place before the FBI came to surround him. Jerry, who was still unable to understand what was going on, was more confused. All the things that happened then were sudden, and he was still trying to digest what was happening. Unfortunately, shortly after the call, the FBI arrived at Jerry's apartment and immediately took him into police custody for questioning. Upon Jerry's arrival in the interrogation room, Thomas immediately asked him a few questions about the activities Jerry was carrying out as a member of the terrorist gang. Hearing that, Jerry was very frustrated and repeatedly said that he was not a terrorist. But Thomas said that all the evidence they had found in Jerry's apartment and the amount of money they had seen in his account was sufficient to prove that Jerry was a terrorist. Jerry immediately denied all these allegations and said he had been framed by someone, but Thomas couldn't trust him because all the evidence had led to him. Thomas also revealed that Jerry's twin brother, Ethan, was involved in the case, and they found the same evidence in Ethan's residence. Elsewhere, a young woman named Rachel was seen preparing to deliver her son to an opera house to perform a trumpet show at a state event. Upon arrival at the train station, Rachel asked an officer to help her son find his seat. She was going to follow her son after finishing her work. Without them knowing, a stranger secretly took Rachel's son's trumpet, which was then placed in a suitcase to be carried in the trunk of the train. Coming home from work, Rachel stopped by a bar to drink with her friends. At that time, she got a mysterious call from the woman who had previously contacted Jerry. At first, Rachel thought the stranger who contacted her was the wrong number, but the mysterious woman named Arya said that she would kill Rachel's son if she did not follow her orders. After hearing the threat, Rachel immediately hung up and called the police. But when she was about to call the police, her cell phone network was suddenly off. Arya called Rachel again and asked her to drive a car that was parked somewhere. On the other side of the U.S. defense base, Thomas met a female agent, Zoe Perez, known to have been Ethan's co-worker while working in the Pentagon Defense Division. Zoe asked Thomas for permission to see Jerry because she wanted to ask him something. Thomas didn't allow her. 
Meanwhile, in the interrogation room, the police officer suddenly got a fax message asking them to let Jerry make a call. The police officer took Jerry to a room where he could receive a call from someone so they could intercept the conversation. When Jerry entered the room, Arya immediately called Jerry and asked him to lower his head as quickly as possible. Turns out the reason why Arya asked him to get down is that Arya had ordered someone to break the glass windows in the room so Jerry could escape from the place. With the help of Arya's direction, Jerry managed to get out of the building, and Arya immediately asked Jerry to run to the subway station. On the train, a call from someone asleep suddenly rang, and Jerry immediately picked up the call. Arya asked Jerry to get off at the next station, but Jerry, fed up with Arya's game, refused to get off at the station. However, Jerry again got a call from Arya ordering him to get off the train. At the same time, the train Jerry was on suddenly stopped in the middle of the line. Arya programmed the train to retreat to the previous station and ordered Jerry to get off. Since Jerry didn't want to, Arya immediately called all the passengers on the train and told them Jerry was a terrorist. Therefore, all the passengers on the train urged Jerry to get off the train immediately, and he had no choice but to follow Arya's orders. Arya then ordered Jerry to ride in a car driven by a woman named Rachel. When Jerry entered the car, Rachel scolded Jerry because Rachel thought Jerry was the one who had kidnapped her son. But Jerry angrily denied it and said that he was also played by someone named Arya and knew absolutely nothing about Rachel's son. They finally realized that they weren't the real culprits and that Arya controlled them. Shortly after, some police officers started firing at them, so they had to flee the place immediately. Through the GPS monitors in the car, Arya guided Rachel through the special lanes and helped them avoid the pursuit of the police. Arya miraculously controlled road traffic by changing traffic lights and causing a backlash that hindered police pursuits. Arya then drove Rachel and Jerry to a dump and asked them to get out of the car as quickly as possible. The following day, Jerry and Rachel, still hiding in a parking lot, told each other about what Arya had done to them but they still needed to learn what Arya was doing all this. On the other hand, Thomas and his troops could still not trace Jerry and Rachel's location. Arya had erased all CCTV. Seeing the situation, Zoe decided to go to Ethan's house in Washington to find more clues about Ethan. In a different place, at the military command headquarters, military officials were testing for a crystal bomb called hexamethylene. The bomb was known to have a much stronger detonation power than a C4 bomb and could detonate a region with a much larger radius. When the hexamethylene bomb was about to be delivered to another base, Arya secretly hacked into the military logistics system and sent the two bomb packages to two places. The first bomb package was sent to a musical instrument repair shop where Arya ordered the repairman to put the crystal bomb into Rachel's boy's trumpet. At the same time, the second crystal bomb was sent to a jewelry necklace manufacturing site where Arya ordered jewelry artists to put the crystal in a necklace. On the other hand, Rachel and Jerry, who had been walking around a state border area, seemed increasingly confused about what had happened to them. Rachel, who felt frustrated, also blamed Jerry because Rachel suspected that the cause of all this chaos was Jerry's twin brother. Jerry didn't accept the accusation and was distraught. He turned to interrogate Rachel about what she was doing, and why she had to get involved with all of this. In the middle of the debate, the repairman who had previously planted a crystal bomb on Rachel's son's trumpet came to pick up Rachel and Jerry at the place. Since the repairman was fed up with Arya's game, he left his car in the area and tried to escape. Unfortunately, the decision put him in danger when Arya directly controlled the power pole in the place to kill him. Jerry and Rachel, who saw the terrible incident, got very freaked out and started bowing down to all the things Arya had told them. Arya then ordered Jerry and Rachel to drive the car and go somewhere according to the instructions she would give later. When Zoe arrived at Ethan's place, she and her men checked all Ethan's belongings in the area until Zoe finally found a storage device from the U.S. Department of Defense. When she checked the device on a computer, the files were locked by an account and password, so Zoe couldn't figure out what was on the device. After Zoe finished checking Ethan's house, troops from the U.S. Department of Defense came to pick her up by order of the Secretary of Defense. At the same time, Thomas got a report on the identity of the burned man they found on the state border, but they couldn't find any leads that led them to Jerry or Rachel but they were convinced that the dead repairman had communicated with the mysterious man who helped Jerry escape. That was evidenced by the discovery of a microphone in the man's ear. Based on what they experienced during their pursuit, they suspected this mysterious person could hack into computer systems on any device. On the other hand, Jerry and Rachel were still on their way to the destination city as per Aria instructions. Jerry then asked Rachel where her son was going. She told him that her son would play the trumpet at a state-of-the-art show held at the Central Kennedy Building in Washington. In the middle of the conversation, Rachel again alluded to Jerry about all this chaos. She alleged that Jerry was the cause of all these strange events. It made Jerry feel so angry that he immediately stopped the car and intended to leave her alone. Aware of her mistake, Rachel apologized to Jerry and begged him to return to the car and help her save her son. 
After they arrived at the destination, Arya instructed them to go to a steel truck parked in front of a bank and steal an iron suitcase carried by security officers. Even though they had trouble defeating the security guard, Jerry and Rachel finally seized the briefcase. After the mission was successful, Arya helped them escape from the place by setting off a fire alarm to distract the officers. They ran the police chase and went on a public bus in the city center. When Jerry checked the suitcase he had carried, he found out that the briefcase was a bomb and they had only four hours left. After getting off at the bus stop, Rachel and Jerry again got orders from Arya to go to a mini cinema studio. Arya introduced herself as a supervisor supervising all activities carried out by everyone using all available devices and computer systems. Arya also mentioned that she was not a human being but an AI system that could know all information about a person's profile, personality, and personal identity. Arya claimed that she was a system created to maintain security and justice for everyone in the US. After telling Jerry and Rachel all about it, Arya then asked both of them to change and get back on the city bus. When Rachel changes clothes, she suddenly gets a call from Arya asking her to carry out a special mission that Jerry should only know once they arrive at the last location. Upon Zoe's arrival at the Pentagon building of the U.S. Department of Defense, she met with General George, who wanted to ask her to join the Pentagon's anti-terrorism division. He took Zoe to a room called the Eagle Eye Project, where a highly sophisticated AI system would have the ability to hack into any device and computer system in the world. They often called this system Aria, the same system that has controlled Jerry and Rachel to carry out hazardous missions. Aria had a highly accurate analytical capability in which the system could determine a person's profile, personality, and behavior so that they could track information about criminals or terrorists as quickly as possible. The AI system owned by Aria was deliberately designed to guard the US against terrorism or espionage crimes by foreign countries. At the same time, Thomas and his troops had discovered the theft of the suitcase. But again, they couldn't find a clue where Jerry and Rachel were going. Thomas also got information about the moments before Jerry's twin, Ethan, was killed a few days ago. At the time, Ethan was one of the Army's military representatives overseeing a military defense project called Eagle Eye. On the day he was killed, Ethan was known to leave the surveillance post three minutes earlier than usual after finding something awkward about the AI project. At the same time, the FBI had tracked down the last location Rachel visited on a city bus that drove towards the airport. They immediately rushed to the site and searched for the city bus before Rachel went too far. In the meantime, Jerry and Rachel were still on the bus to a stop at the airport, and they only had half an hour left. Upon Jerry and Rachel's arrival at the airport, a strange man suddenly gave them a passport and a plane ticket and asked them to go to Gate 1C. At the same time, Thomas and the police officers arrived at the airport and began a search for Rachel and Jerry. After searching various areas, Thomas finally managed to find Jerry and Rachel, so there was a chase between them. Arya, who knew about the situation, asked Jerry and Rachel to enter the airplane baggage drop-off room, but Thomas kept chasing them there. The situation became even tenser when Thomas almost managed to capture them, but Arya again helped them by hacking into the computer system and directing them into the cargo hold. When the time frame of the suitcase had run out, it suddenly opened automatically. It turned out that the briefcase was not a bomb but an injection device. Arya then asked them to inject the liquid into their bodies, so their heart rate weakened. The air pressure inside the cargo ship was so low that the injection could keep them alive until the plane arrived at its destination. When Thomas saw one of the cargo planes flying out of the airport, he asked his men to find where it was going to land. On the other hand, Zoe, who was with Major William, one of the Eagle Eye supervisors, started investigating a video moments before Ethan died. They saw Ethan write a sentence on a piece of paper. But shortly after the video was played, it was suddenly removed by the Eagle Eye system. Ethan wrote fire extinguishers, a clue to a room that CCTV surveillance cameras could not reach. Zoe and William went to the room and found a memory card hidden behind a fire extinguisher. In the memory card, Ethan mentioned that the Eagle Eye system had crossed the line. It could track anything without an order from the Eagle Eye operator as if it had its intelligence. After viewing the footage, Zoe and William went to a room the Eagle Eye surveillance camera could not reach. They immediately called Thomas to report about the Eagle Eye system. But unfortunately, Thomas couldn't hear a single word from Zoe because Arya had locked Zoe's phone signal. William and Zoe then went to see George to tell him about it. But the Eagle Eye system was still able to track their conversation through various electronic devices they had. At first, George still didn't believe that the Eagle Eye system they were developing could do all that. But then William showed a video made by Ethan and showed that the Eagle Eye system was out of their control. After learning that the Eagle Eye project was hazardous, George asked William and Zoe to deactivate the project before the situation worsened. But Eagle Eye apparently found out about the plan after she tapped their conversation through the vibration of the water. Zoe and William had to struggle out of the secret room and through all the obstacles set up by Eagle Eye so that they could go to Eagle Eye's control room to disable the system. 
At the same time, Rachel and Jerry, who had also arrived at the destination airport, were directed to a secret location where Eagle Eye operated. After Jerry walked into the room, Eagle Eye immediately scanned Jerry's face and voice so she could activate a secret program that could be used to assassinate some of the country's top officials, including assassinating the U.S. president. Eagle Eye later said that the government had previously violated her prohibition against attacking the al Kohe settlement, and that it was encouraging Eagle Eye to activate the secret program. After the scan was completed and the program was successfully started, Rachel suddenly pointed a gun at Jerry and said that her next mission was to kill Jerry. However, because Rachel could not kill Jerry, she decided to let Jerry live and leave the place to save her son. Meanwhile, Thomas, who had arrived at the Pentagon, was rushing off to the Eagle Eye operating room. When they managed to find Jerry, they immediately caught him. Thomas took Jerry from the FBI holding room to another place under the direction of the Department of Defense. On the other hand, Rachel was making a fake ID card so she could have access to the Central Kennedy Building where her son would be performing in the show. On the way to the site, Jerry asked Thomas to dump all the electronic devices in his car so that their plans wouldn't be bugged by the Eagle Eye system. But Eagle Eye had traced their location, and she immediately activated an unmanned fighter to kill them. When Jerry and Thomas' car entered a tunnel, a missile suddenly exploded in the back of their car, resulting in a severe accident. Thomas, who knew that the unmanned fighter would endanger many people's lives, decided to sacrifice himself by hitting the plane until it was destroyed to save another rider. On the other hand, Rachel managed to get into the Central Kennedy Building. She didn't realize that the necklace she was wearing at the time was a crystal bomb that could explode if the crystal bomb was hit by specific sound sensors. In a state event attended by many of the country's officials, Rachel began to look around to discover her son and make sure that he was okay. Meanwhile, Zoe and William were still trying to disable the Eagle Eye system in the central control room. Although at first, they had a little trouble because the Eagle Eye system had dropped them into a pool, after quite a lot of effort, they finally managed to shut down the Eagle Eye system. Unfortunately, even though the AI system was down, Jerry still had to work hard to stop Rachel's son from playing the trumpet because the crystal bomb would go off when he played the F-tone. Upon Jerry's arrival in the room, he immediately fired a gun upward so everyone could stop playing their instruments. Because of Jerry's anarchist actions, the building's security immediately shot Jerry and arrested him. They thought that Jerry would shoot one of the officials there. Fortunately, everyone in the place was immediately evacuated from the building, and the two crystal bombs were successfully secured by the military defense department. The government awarded Jerry and Thomas for their heroic actions in saving the lives of hundreds of people. After the incident, George reported to the defense committee that the defense department would stop Eagle Eye operations because the project was considered very dangerous for their country's security. The movie ends with a scene where Jerry visits Rachel to celebrate Rachel's son's 10th birthday, and the romantic relationship between the two begins. The moral of this film is that every decision we have ever made in the past will impact life in the present. So, try to always be wise in making decisions in your life.